Welcome to the Lessons from Lab and Life podcast brought to you by New England Biolabs. I'm your host, Lydia Morrison, and I hope this podcast offers you some new perspective. Today, I'm joined by NEB Senior Technical Support Scientist, Rachel Carver-Brown. Rachel's here to join me to kick off our molecular cloning series. And today we'll be talking about mutagenesis, both site-directed mutagenesis and multi-point mutagenesis, and the products that NEB offers to help support this. Rachel, thanks so much for coming down to the studio today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So Rachel, tell our listeners what mutagenesis is and why a researcher might want to use it. Mutagenesis is making a specific change of a plasmid sequence. It is adding in some, perhaps a his tag into the plasmid or making a change in the sequence to change which amino acid is at a given position. Researchers would want to use this you know, for those reasons, but also it can be used to change the sequence and add a restriction site into a plasmid or actually even change it to remove a restriction site, which that's helpful, I know, in the AnyBridge workflow. Those are reasons why mutagenesis is often employed. It's mostly just making a change to the sequence that's there. And are there different ways of accomplishing mutagenesis? There's two main methods to accomplish a site-directed mutagenesis, and the differences there lie in the types of primers that are used. One method that's used, um, the common quick change method, uses overlapping primers, and those overlapping primers result in the double-stranded plasmid at the end that, with NICs, and that is then taken into transformation, and the cells seal those NICs. The other method, and the method that our Q5 site-directed mutagenesis kit employs, uses back-to-back primers. These primers, they're five prime ends butt up against each other, and that's where mutations are introduced and they'll amplify in opposite directions around the plasmid. That results in an exponential amplification, which is much more efficient than a linear amplification you would get with the overlapping primers. Could you explain a little bit more about why our kit uses the back-to-back primers that you mentioned instead of overlapping primers, and a little bit more about sort of how those work? Sure. The back-to-back primers, the main reason that our Q5 site-directed mutagenesis kit uses the back-to-back primers is because it allows for a much more efficient and exponential amplification. So their primers, essentially, if you think about it, they're sitting at like 12 o'clock on a clock face, and they'll go down and round in opposite directions. And that ends up with a linear product, which can then be exponentially amplified with those primers as the PCR cycles continue. The overlapping primers, because of how they are oriented and how far around the plasmid they'll go, they actually only have a linear amplification. That matters because the linear amplification, you need to start with a lot more material than you would with an exponential amplification. So having a large amount of plasmid in there to start can actually be difficult for PCR reactions, having too much input. Whereas with the exponential, starting with a very small amount of plasmid, that PCR reaction runs more efficiently. Understood. So it sounds like it kind of solves for a couple of problems. Speaking of problems, what are the most common problems that customers face when they're using the kit? The most common problem that I hear with the site-directed mutagenesis kit is ending up with wild-type colonies at the end. You know, you go through all the effort to make the change, and the result actually isn't changed. Um, That's the most common issue that I'll hear about. And it's actually something that is fairly easy to investigate and figure out where the problem lies. And how do you go about that? The first thing to do would be to check and make sure that what you're amplifying in the PCR step actually is what you're intending to. So if you run the PCR product on a gel and there's no amplification at all, you know, you don't get a band, then that's your problem. Um, And then we just work together and figure out the PCR reaction and get that working. So is it always necessary to run the PCR amplified fragment on a gel prior to using the DNA in a workflow? It's not necessary to run it every single time. Um, If you're working with a similar set of primers that you've you've used before, or if you're doing a high throughput, you may not want to screen every single primer set. Um, But certainly if you 
run into wild type colonies or issues downstream, that is probably the first place to check um, and the first troubleshooting step I'd recommend. Can researchers use homebrew competent cells in this workflow? They can, yes. Um, we do have two versions of our site-directed butagenesis kit. One includes our NEB5-alpha high-efficiency comp cells, but we do have a version without comp cells, so researchers can definitely use their own. Um, you know, if they were high-efficiency and cells that work well in, in their workflows in the past, they can definitely use those. And how accurate is the Q5 site-directed mutagenesis method for generating desired mutations or indels? The accuracy of the kit is kind of twofold. It uses the Q5 high-fidelity polymerase. So the high-fidelity aspect of that, it's proofreading activity and its innate you know, accuracy in copying the plasmid sequence is great and gives very high accuracy in that regard. In terms of the number of colonies at the end of the reaction, assuming PCR worked well, Typically, we'd see at least 75, not 80 percent of correct mutagenized colonies. Wow, that's pretty high efficiency, pretty high odds. It is pretty high. Um, you know, our, our QC standards are pretty high for the kit, and we, our ex customer experiences that I've heard, you know, it's matching for them. Customers really like using the kit. Okay, so what about multi-site mutagenesis as opposed to a single-site mutagenesis? Would someone do multi, like multiple rounds of site-directed mutagenesis, or is there another way to accomplish that? So if a researcher is wanting to make multiple changes within the same plasmid, they certainly could use the Q5 site-directed mutagenesis kit and make those changes sequentially. So you go introduce the first change, go through the whole process, the KLD, the growth, the transformation, and then use that resulting plasmid in the next round and the next round and so on. Um, that does take a lot of time, though, and another way to go about it would be to use the AnyBuilder Hi-Fi Assembly Kit. The Hi-Fi Assembly allows you to put together multiple fragments, and you can actually introduce those mutations of the overlaps of that workflow. Mm -hmm. So those multiple mutations would be introduced on each fragment and would be able to be assembled all in one reaction, in one go. Well, that seems a lot more efficient. It is. Yes, and it saves a lot of time, and a lot of people are moving to that for multi-site mutagenesis. Yeah, does it end up saving materials too? Like saving, like overall it saves time. Does it, I mean, I guess it would end up saving like comp cells in terms of growth and, and time for that. It would definitely save comp cells as well, yes, because you're not, you know, having to do the growth each time as you would with the sequential SDM kit reactions. Um, saves on amplification reagents too in some ways because you're not necessarily having to go through and troubleshoot that as often as well. Gotcha. So Rachel, before I let you go, what are your top tips for a researcher who's trying to perform mutagenesis? It's a great question. One of the first things I'd suggest is to use our Any Base Changer Primer Design tool. That helps make the primer design process of those back-to-back -back primers much more streamlined. And our, we actually have a new version of the AnyBase Changer tool that enhances capability. You can use it in batch mode, and it's a lot clearer in terms of making amino acid changes. That new tool um, will have a video tutorial coming up soon, hopefully, um, to help you walk through it even more. But if you do have questions, you can always reach out to tech support for that as well. Awesome. Anything else? If it's the first time with the kit, the other thing I would suggest is running that PCR product on a gel, you know, just to be comfortable and be confident in your first round through it. You know, it's, again, it's not necessary, but for the first time, I would definitely suggest that. The last tip I'd have is if you do run into any problems with the kit in terms of, you know, you have wild type colonies at the end, which is the most common thing that they might run into. Give it another go. But if after the two iterations, it's still not giving you the results you need, call tech support. We're more than happy to help. We have a lot of scientists very knowledgeable on the kit that can help walk you through and troubleshoot with you and to get you the correct product at the end. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rachel. I think this will be a really informational podcast for people who are new to cloning and new to mutagenesis. And it's also a great reminder that 
We have amazing scientists providing tech support to our customers. So don't be afraid to reach out if you run into problems because someone like Rachel will help walk you through all the solutions to make sure that your experiment is working successfully. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Lessons from Lab and Life podcast. I'd like to take a moment to remind you where to find the helpful resources we mentioned in this conversation. Head over to our website, neb.com, to find videos and animations, as well as the answers to some questions our tech support team frequently receives. If you need to reach tech support yourself, you can email info at neb.com within the U.S. And if you're outside of the States, please contact your local NEB subsidiary or distributor to receive help from our knowledgeable global technical support team. Please be sure to tune in next time for our second episode of the Molecular Cloning series, when we'll be talking about Golden Gate Assembly. Golden Gate Assembly is a seamless DNA assembly technique that can be used to join many, many fragments of DNA in a single reaction.